also encourage you to stay for Sunday school, and at this time we'll turn it over to the pastor. Bring us God's word. Thank you, brother. I failed to mention uh, also that Amy Weaver, she had a surgery this week as well. Her surgery was successful, but continue to pray for her as she recovers. Uh, Amy, Amy Weaver, she had a surgery on Thursday, so be praying for her. Take your Bibles this morning as we go into God's Word and turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, if we continue our journey through this wonderful gospel, uh, possibly my favorite gospel, but I say that about pretty much every book found in the Word of God. We're going to be in verses 12 through 26 today. Um, and when you find your place in John's gospel at verse 12, stand with me as we honor God's holy word and follow along with me as I read verses 12 through 26. John chapter 12, verse 12. <clears throat> On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him. And cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Sion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting upon an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. And may God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father God, a praying church is a living church. We come before you this morning, Lord, only in the power of your Son. He is King, and he reigns at this moment. He is upon the throne. We thank you for this notion, this thought, this truth, that even now, despite my words, our God reigns. I pray, Father, that you would use this fallible man to speak your truth in a manner that your seed would fall upon further, fertile soil and take root. Guide us this day. Show us your truth and teach us your word. In Jesus' name, amen. As you can probably already see, this is the Palm Sunday passage. This is that passage of Scripture that is so often preached from, from a flyover look. Unfortunately, because this passage is, I'll even use a term that maybe is almost belittling of the text, and I mean no such thing, but it's, it's almost over-preached. Um, it becomes a Palm Sunday passage. Everybody comes to this text or a text just like it. It's found in all four Gospels. Um, they come to this text and a preacher will preach this passage because it falls into a certain point in the calendar. And the only unfortunate thing about that is that whenever we approach a text in that manner, we, go a fl we fly over the text, and we, we hit the key points, and we don't really dig that much deeper into this passage. Friends, this morning, I, I want to encourage you. I want to 
uh, I want to open the light that is found in the depth of this scripture. We, I hope to show you this morning something that you've never seen in this passage. Not that I'm teaching some new thing out of the text. I'm to, I'm, I want to show you the depth of what we've just read. I want to show you how magnificent this text is, how all-encompassing this text is. This is a beautiful passage of Scripture. And at the forefront of it, we are met with Jesus Christ, the King. The King of the world, the King of Israel. Jesus, the Messiah. Hosanna, Jesus, the King. And that is how we approach today. That is how we look at what we're about to study. The thought, or subject rather, if you would, about this text is true worship. True worship. The title of this message this morning is When Worship is Mute, as you can see from your handout. I will elaborate on that a little bit more this morning as we journey through this text. But I want to begin, as I usually begin before a message, by posing to you a question. I want to ask you this question. I want to catch you off guard. I want you to think. I want you to see. This is the question. Why are you here? Why are you here? And I don't mean here like living, breathing in the world, you know, moving around living. I'm talking about here. I don't need an answer. I don't need a show of hands. I'm just, I want to ask you that question this morning. Why did you come? Is it routine? Is it that, hey, it's Sunday. This is the day we go to church. Did you come because you feel obligated? Like, if I don't go, somebody's going to get mad at me. My wife won't let me hear the end of it, et cetera, or whatever it may be. Or did you come here this morning? To hear a word from God. Not that any man behind the pulpit can even remotely lay claim to speaking his own words to be the word of God. Do not misunderstand me. But that the Bible itself is the very word of God. And you came here eager this morning to hear from God. I trust throughout the week. You have prayed for your brothers and sisters in Christ. I trust that you have done that. I trust that the Holy Spirit has brought you to a point in your Christian walk where you daily bring these before him in prayer. You've lifted them before God that their faith may be increased and their lives would be entirely led by God. No doubt you have prayed for your pastor that he would deliver you. This is what you should pray for your pastor. This is the prayer. This is not some prideful request. You should pray that he would deliver you the truth. You should pray that he would be so founded upon the scriptures that he wants to bring you nothing else but then thus saith the Lord. That's your prayer. Bring us the truth. Sir, we would see Jesus. That's your plea. That's your prayer. Why have you come today? We can fall into the doldrums of worship. Have you been there? Are you there? We can fall into the doldrum, doldrums of worship. A spirit slumber, a spiritual slumber is all too eager, friends, to befall us. Do you know what Satan would like you to do? Have a spirit of slumber in worship. He doesn't want you to come into full subjection to God. Worship can become routine, and we then arrive at a point where we are simply just going through the motions. Our hearts are cold. The honeymoon is over. The fire has died down. And we're just, not to put it lightly, friends, we're bored. Anytime we enter this building, anytime we enter this building, whether it be for church service, whether it be for Sunday evening, whether it be for Wednesday night, whether it be for a graduation banquet, whether it be for a picnic, Whatever reason we come to this church house for, it is to hear a word from God. It is to stand for the truth of the Bible. It is to have fellowship with other like-minded believers in the Spirit of God. It is for the purpose of God. 
It is why we exist. You can't expect your friends to bring you this truth. You can't expect your church leaders to open your ears to this truth. You can't even expect your pastor to open your ears to this truth. You must come hungry to hear, thus saith the Lord. I want to hear from God today. I'm coming to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords because he reigns. He reigns now. He is on his throne at this moment. He is in our midst, in our hearts. He leads us by his word. He is worthy to be praised. That is worship. But we slip We slip into a doldrum. We slip into a a spiritual slumber. We slip into a boredom. So what is worship? Worship, by definition, is a bowing down. That's what it means. When we come to God's word, we take God's word, we open God's word, we see God's word, we hear and are slain by God's word, and we bow to God's word. That is worship. Literally, this is what it means in the Greek, and I don't want to try to baffle you with some sort of you know, in-depth definition, but this is what it means. To prostrate someone, oneself, to prostrate yourself upon the ground and kiss. Did you know that? That's what worship is. Worship is to prostrate oneself down on the ground before Christ and kiss. How? How kiss? You know, kiss, kiss the feet. I picture, I picture kissing his blessed feet. I, I, I picture literally groveling to the most holy thing in existence. I picture coming before truth personified and falling upon my face and literally kissing him with tears. That's what it means to worship. That you have such a a knowledge of God, that you've been so turned by his word, that you come before him crawling on your hands and knees, saying, worthy is the lamb. That is worship. And does it end here? Does it only take place here? Like we've come here at 9.15, we seek to worship And then at 10 o'clock, nooner, if you stay for Sunday school, afternoon, worship is over. Is that what that means? No way. Worship doesn't stop. Worship is life. You are so driven and convicted by the truth. You are before God on your hands, on your face, 24-7. That is worship. So there's, that poses some questions, and that may be a little bit contrary to our idea of worship today. When we see Jesus, we see who Jesus is at his word, illumined to us by the Spirit of God, we worship the God of the universe. We bow down before the throne of Jesus. We come here, friends, to see Jesus. I know your time is precious. All week long, I think about delivering you the word, the precious truth, the living bread of life. I want to show you Jesus. That's what my, the second I go home on a Sunday evening, you know what I'm thinking about? Sunday morning. I want to feed the sheep. I want to bring them truth. I want to show them Christ. I want to lead them to Jesus and get out of the way. That's my life. I love being able to be in this word. I know your time is precious. I know your week is filled with challenges and circumstances that put your backs against the fence. It's hard enough to eke out two hours on a Sunday to come to church. I understand this. I'm not here to dazzle you with some kind of superficial motivational speech or try to teach you how to live a happier life. I don't want you to come here looking for a band-aid on the problems of the world, for your world, a temporary fix, a shot in the arm of a feel-good story, a, a mixed bag of emotions. I'm not here to do that. Places like that are a dime a dozen, friends. If you want to hear a motiva- motivational speech, just find the biggest church you can find and go there. You'll hear one. But places where the word of God is esteemed highly and preached As the word commands, preach the word, 2 Timothy. As the word is preached, those are becoming more and more less common. We come here to see Jesus, the King. There are enough times throughout your week that cause your ground to shake. But here, 
in this place, in this moment, is the only time that you will find solid ground. Here we come to see the foundation of which our lives are founded upon. Husbands come desiring to be better men and fathers, wives, and they come to pray that their husband would lead and be more like Jesus Christ. Children come searching for truth, wondering if there is such a thing as true love. The people of God come to worship saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. It has often been said by many preachers, I love this. I've heard it by several, several men that I have great respect for. Preacher, take the biblical text and make a beeline for the cross. It's also been said elsewhere, all roads lead to London. Well, all scripture leads to Jesus. This morning and every time that we come through these church house doors, the cry of our hearts, the cry of God's people must be, Sir, we would see Jesus. Show me Jesus. The preacher must take you by the hand, point to Jesus, and get out of the way. But in the church today, we have lost what it means to worship Christ. When I come to the scriptures, I approach the Bible with such a way that I'm going to worship with reading the Bible. Did you know that that's a form of worship? When you come to the Bible, when you read the Bible, you are actually in worship. This can only be accomplished by asking God to teach us what he is showing us in his word. The book of Psalms tells us plainly. Psalm 96 verse 4 reads this, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, lowercase g. When I say we have lost what it means to worship, I truly mean that we have no idea what God means when he commands us and requires worship. Simply because he is God. When I say worship, if I were to go through this church house this morning and I were to say to you, tell me what worship is, or what do you think? What's the first thought that comes to your mind when I say the word worship? More often than not, the first word or thought that comes into your brain when I say worship is music. Maybe I'm wrong. But today, when we say worship, immediately we think music. Now, hold on to your chairs. This shouldn't be. When I say worship, our minds should not go music. Yes, music is a huge part of worship. Please, don't misunderstand me. I will even go as far as to say that God highly regards music. He has an entire book of 153, 150 psalms, songs, psalms. He does value music. But do you know what is not with the psalms? Music notes. The words are there. The truth is there. The entire book of Psalms is about God, the person, the character of God. But music is not the heart of worship. What is the basis of worship music that is so highly regarded? Is it the backbeat? Is it the rhythm or even the particular instruments being used? Is it close proximity to pop culture music with a Christian bent? Worship has absolutely nothing. I know this is going to probably rock some of your minds. Worship has absolutely nothing to do with music. Did you know that? Music is a beautiful secondary that prepares our hearts for God and points us to the truth of God. But within the song is truth. There is the heart of worship. The truth. Worship is established on the basis of truth. Every song that has ever been sung in the church house that has had any impact upon the lives of people has had a heart of truth. For instance, true worship music is timeless. Did you know this? Simply because what is contained inside the song. It's timeless. True worship music is the heartbeat of the song is the depth of biblical truth found within that music, within that song. For instance, let me just share a text with you. Amazing Grace. This is one that we all know. You come to the song Amazing Grace and you say, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Have you, ever, have you ever contemplated the biblical truth that's found in that one verse? Amazing grace, only grace, saved by grace, saved through grace. 
amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Is it the music note that the sweet sound is? Or is it the truth? Someone preached to you the truth of God's word. That's the sweet sound. Jesus Christ is Lord. There is the sweet sound. Repent and come to Christ. There's the sweet sound. Your sins are forgiven. There's the sweet sound. That saved. Saved from what? Saved from the wrath of God, a wretch like me. Have you ever called yourself a wretch lately? That's a term we don't really like to call ourselves. But do you know that it's true? We are wretched. We are so wretched. And when in comparison with Jesus Christ and we see his beauty and his perfection and his holiness and we see ourselves in comparison with Jesus Christ, we're like, yes, I am a wretch. And your word tells me that I'm a wretch. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. I am a wretch, Lord Jesus, and I need your righteousness. You see what the theological depth is in just that simple, lovely verse of amazing grace? Let me give you another one. This, this was interesting to me, and I want to share this with you. This song, this hymn, was actually written in the 8th century. I didn't know that. This is an amazing hymn of the faith. This is the hymn. Be Thou My Vision. Have you heard this song? Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Not be all else to me, save as Thou art. Make nothing in this world comparable to to you. That's what that means. This was written in the 8th century. The last verse reads this. Riches I need not, nor man's empty praise, thou my inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. Get this, this is big. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, Thou tre- thy treasure thou art. You are my treasure. You are number one in my heart. Can you feel? Do you understand? Can you sense the truth in worship? Now, and just in case you think that I'm picking on, you know, the new guys, and you think that I'm, I'm casting all so-called, quote-unquote, contemporary music to the side, just in case you think I'm taking that band around, I want to share, you, share with you something from David Crowder's song, Okay. David Crowder is a new young guy. He's got a big, gnarly-looking beard, and he plays some pretty good music. But I'm going to say to you, the theological depth of one of his songs is enough to spark worship. I want to share these words with you. This song is called All My Hope. Maybe you have heard it. And this should cause worship in our hearts. This is what that song reads. David Crowder is a contemporary Christian artist. But I want to show, share with you why this is important, these words. Just listen. I've been held by the Savior. Great. We have a song that acknowledges there is a Savior. Do you you catch me? Because if we listen to a lot of today's contemporary music, we actually come to hear that this song that I'm hearing could actually be played in a nightclub or in the church. Because it could be written about your boyfriend or your girlfriend or God. There's no words in there that stipulate we're talking about God, but this song that David Crowder has written and sang, it's clear, friends. I've I've been held by the Savior. I've felt fire from above. I've been down to that river, and I ain't the same. Now, yeah, terminology, actually, spell check came up whenever I typed that. Ain't is not a word, and I ain't supposed to say it. The prodigal returned. All my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood. Give me a song that tells me about Jesus. Give me a song that tells me about forgiveness. Give me a song that tells me about the blood of the Lamb that was shed for the sins of the world. Tell me about that and I will worship. That's what this is all about. Truth in the heart of worship. There's many things that try to lead us astray away from the truth of God. There are many things that want to rob you of your joy, many things that want to steal away the truth out of your life, many things that will suppress and deceive you in your sin, in your life, and you have come to worship unrepentant, maybe even unredeemed, and worship is muted. But I want to get to the text this morning. I don't want to waste your time talking about the white area. I want to give to you the black words. I want to give to you the truth. Look at verse 12. 
This is amazingly deep. On the next day, next day from what? Remember, what had just taken place? The, ne- the thing that just took place was that Mary had washed the feet of Jesus with that expensive ointment and wiped it up with her hair. The dinner was set at probably Simon, the leper's house, where, where Mary had done this, this act of worship of Jesus. The next day takes place. This is actually, for those of you that are studying chronologically through the end of this book, this is eight days before the crucifixion, before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're talking about eight days from the empty tomb. The next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So you can picture this. Much people, the word that tells us, the the Bible tells us that much people were there. We're talking about thousands. And I want to share with you this morning, this is Passover time, right? This is the time of Passover. So there is some Jewish historians claim that there could be anywhere from 1 million to 2.5 million people in Jerusalem at this time. And here comes Jesus, the king. Possibly 2.5 million people flooding Jerusalem, and the king is here. This, is, this should really cause us to take a, let's put the brakes on and see what's about to happen here. This is recorded in all four Gospels. We come to a question. Verse 13. They took branches, all these people, these people took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's so amazing. Have you ever asked yourself, you know, remember, friends, we've come to this text how many times on Palm Sunday, but have you ever asked yourself, why palm trees, why palm branches? I've heard the argument, well, just because they're in abundance, we're talking about the date tree, that's the palm branches from the date tree that they actually cut down and carried with them to the backside of the temple in the Brook Kidron Valley is where Jesus would have been walking through at this time, and they're carrying these big, long palm branches. Have you ever asked yourself, why palm branches? Why would God, in his divine providence, perform this? What does it mean that these individuals grab palm branches? Why not... Something else, a bush. Why not something else? Why specifically palm branches? Is there any theological uh, importance to the use of palm branches? Well, there is. There is. There's There's a historical importance to the use of palm branches, and there's a future eschatological importance to the use of palm branches. I want to show you that this morning. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40, and remember, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He is the fulfillment of the Old Covenant. And I want you to see in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40, this is what we read. Talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus himself, all of the feasts that were performed in the Old Testament, you read through the Old Testament, you find the Feast of Tabernacles, you find the Feast of Passover, you find these many different feasts that take place, and you wonder, why so many feasts? Why so many different nuances into these different operations of the law? Why did they have to do all this? Because, friends, I've told you this before, that I've taught this before, that every one of the feasts pointed to Jesus. Every one of the feasts that are prescribed in the Levitical law point to Jesus Christ. So whenever we come to this passage that we hear about the palm branches, it's actually fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. That Jesus himself is the fulfillment of the Old Testament uh, feast days. Check it out in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40. And we rarely go to Leviticus, but I want you to see this. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of the palm tree, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. That's talking about using palm branches in the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, and Jesus himself is actually the fulfillment of all of these feast days. So when these individuals were waving palm branches, it would have been a symbol of the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, an act of worship, an act of praise. But I told you that it was actually found in the Levitical law, but it's also future. The use of palm branches is also a future pointing to the second coming of Christ. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 7, if you would. Revelation chapter 7, verse 10. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 10, you know by now that the book of Revelation talks about future events that are yet to come. 
And in Revelation chapter 7, verse 10, I know I have you going from one end of the spectrum to the other, but that is good. The Apostle John, who's writing this same gospel, writes the book of Revelation from the Isle of Patmos. And we find in Revelation chapter 7, verse 10, we read this. Remember, keep in mind why palm branches, one to fulfill the, the Feast of Tabernacles and a pointing to the future coming of Christ. Check this out. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb. Oh, I love to read that capital L, Lamb. Clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation in salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb essentially this is a really close language word usage as hosanna salvation of God salvation to God hosanna it's a picture of what we're reading here in John chapter 12 the palm branches have deep theological significance as to why they use this. God paints us a picture of Old Testament fulfillment whenever we read these Gospels. And if we go too quickly, we miss it. Jesus was fulfilling so many prophetical verses, so many prophetical words in just this passage of Scripture. Moving on to verse 14 of John. I, I want to touch on this, the Hosanna before we get to verse 14. Hosanna, blessed is the king, in verse 13. Hosanna, blessed is the king, capital K of Israel, that cometh in the name of the Lord. I love this. This is coronation day. This is the act of crowning a king. The kingly honor and dignity that Jesus demands in him alone is dominion and power. He is the son of David, as Matthew chapter 21 says. He is the one whom Israel looked for. Why were they shouting this? Hosanna, which means salvation to God, salvation of God, salvation bring. These things are so very important to realize that when they were shouting this, Hosanna, 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 blessed is the, na is the king of Israel. When he was saying these things, friends, excuse me, my pinky is failing. When they were shouting these things, they were shouting Hosanna. They were looking to for the Messiah at this time. And you say, well, how? How did they know that Jesus, the Messiah, the Meshua, was to come in this year, at this feast time? The, the same question tied up in the same bag is that how did the Magi know that the king was born? Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, they saw the star. They saw the star in the east, and they went and followed the star. But how were they looking for the king? What was the, what was the information that they found that actually pointed them to the, the king should be born now? That the time was coming. Is there something in the Old Testament that maybe tells us that this year, this 30 A.D., was the year that Messiah, the Meshua, should be cut off? They were looking for Hosanna. They were looking for the king. They were looking for the king of Israel at this time. And Jesus had made his name, he had made his point clear that he was the Messiah. He had made it so abundantly clear with his signs and miracles. I want you to uh, look this morning at Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Now we talked about this in the adult Sunday school time um, several weeks ago. And you ask yourself, how did they know that the Messiah was coming? How did they know that the Messiah would soon be there? And how were they missing the fact that the Messiah would be cut off? I mean, as Jesus is walking up through the brook, the Kidron Valley, he's literally following toward the sheep gate. He's going to the backside of the temple as a lamb for slaughter. And these thousands and if not millions of people are waving palm branches saying, Hosanna, 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 the Lord God reigns, the Lord God reigns, blessed is the King of Israel. Look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. This is a point in your, in your Bible where you should, you should uh, be able to, to discern this, see this, 
and know that the Israelite people were looking for the Messiah on that very year that Jesus was put on the cross. In verse 25, we read Daniel's prophecy like, uh, goes like this. Know therefore and understand. So he's commanding understanding. He's commanding us to sit on this text, meditate upon this until we can get it understood. He said, know and understand. Ask for the Holy Spirit to help us understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And after, verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That means be put to death, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war, uh, unto the end of the war, desolations and determined. Are determined. Now, I want to take a pause there. I want you to know that from the decree, try to f- track with me now, from the decree of Artaxerxes in the Old Testament in Nehemiah chapter 2, which, was t- which took place roughly 445 B.C., we read that decree of Artaxerxes actually commands for the walls of Jerusalem to be rebuilt in 445 B.C. Now, as we read in Daniel here, we read weeks of years. It's important to grasp this. We're talking about 70 total weeks of years. But notice what Daniel said in verse 25. He says, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build the Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks. We're talking about seven weeks of years. That's 49 years. We've talked about this math in Sunday school class. I want you to see that if you calculate these numbers out, you can actually get to the point of 30 A.D., When you total the numbers that Daniel was talking about, you hit 30 A.D. You can't make this up. Nearly 500 years before Christ ever was put upon the cross, Daniel the prophet told us of the year that he would be coming. This is why they were looking in that day at the Kidron Valley. They were looking, holding the palm branches and shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is the King, capital K, King of Israel. Now, I want to move forward with this because I don't want to bog you down with these, with these facts and, and the, the, no, the, the overwhelming knowledge of these different things. I want you to see why this is impactful for us in worship. Go back to John chapter 12, and we will fulfill our time here. Back to John chapter 12, verse number 14. So Jesus is the rightful king. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one who should rightfully reign upon the throne of David. And we get to verse 14. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, a donkey, sat thereon as it is written. Anytime you read and as it is written in the Bible, you know that this is about to be fulfilled in prophecy. Now, I don't want to belabor this point because you know this. That Zechariah 9.9 tells us that the king shall come riding upon a colt the foal of a colt, a donkey. This was an interesting thing. What would you picture if you saw a king riding upon a donkey? You would automatically think, well, what kind of king is this? But during this time, if a king were to come enter, enter into Jerusalem triumphantly upon a donkey, this would symbolize something. The fact that his back was upon a donkey meant humility. This was a humble king. This was the prince of peace. This was the, he was not coming in war. Because if a king that was coming in war, what would he be riding upon? A horse. A big, powerful horse. But Jesus, in his beautiful humility, he comes upon the back of a donkey to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. This is so important to recognize that Jesus is fulfilling. From this point forward, he is just fulfilling text after text after text. Never before, never has there been someone that has fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures in such a way. Jesus just was was moving forward with humility and love, a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But mark it down, friends. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, he will be coming again on a horse. He will be coming upon a horse, and his vesture will be dipped in blood. There will be a name upon his thigh written that no man knows, 
and he will be upon a horse, not a donkey at that time. So I want you to see that if you're following along in your outline, the first point is the fickle crowd. You say, why do you say that? Aren't they just worshiping him? Aren't they praising his name? Look, they're shouting, Hosanna, King of Israel. They want to worship him, right? Mark it down, friends. In five days, they will be shouting, crucify, crucify, crucify. This is the fickle crowd. This is fickle worship. This is a come and kick the Romans out, King, for us, please, kind of worship. Do what we want for us, King, kind of worship. This is not a Lord God of glory, take our sins away. This is an earthly praise, a fickle praise. The second point I have for you this morning is the false worship of the Pharisees. The false worship of the Pharisees is so evidently clear. We've seen this in our journey through the Gospel of John, verse number 16. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him. See, they, then they saw that the Old Testament had been fulfilled in the, in the actions that Jesus was taking on this day. And that they had done these things unto him. Verse 17, the people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. See, they're there for the works. They're there for the signs. They want to see the different miracles. Verse 18, for this cause the people also met him for that they heard that he had done that this miracle. In verse 19, the false worship of the Pharisees. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, listen to their language. Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. You're losing. You're losing this battle. Behold, the world is gone after him. The people ignored, number one, they ignored the religious command of these Pharisees to, if anyone knew where he was, to bring him so that they could capture him and take him and ultimately murder him. But the people ignored that command. The people surrounded Jesus, essentially affording him the opportunity of protection. They, these Pharisees couldn't storm in there and take Jesus from this donkey because he was surrounded by possibly two million people. We also need to qualify a word here. We need to look at verse 19 at the end of this. We see that the Pharisees said, behold, the world is gone after him. Really? Was the entire world at this time following Jesus Christ? Well, no. Yeah, the Pharisees weren't. And we know that this crowd, even in its fickle worship, they would soon turn against him. So they were not all entirely following him. But he is seeing, Pharisees are seeing actually, that there is a mixed group of people in this praising, Hosanna, shouting group of people. We see that there are Greeks involved in this. There are Jews involved in this. There are people from all over the world that are involved in this. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus went right up to the temple sheep gate. He is our Passover lamb, Christians. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, we read this. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. He is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The significance of the course that Jesus took going through the brook, the Kidron Valley, up the backside of the temple, and right into where the sheep went. Jesus was coming to sacrifice himself for sins, lay down his life that we may live. It's important, verse 20, to show you something here. The faithful worship of the Greeks. The faithful worship of the Greeks, verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came to worship at the feast. This is an interesting point because technically the Greeks were not permitted. These were probably proselytes of some kind. They were probably converted to Judaism uh, because they had heard the news. They had heard that the Messiah had come. They had heard that Jesus was to be there and he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But I want you to see that they were coming to worship the future coming king. These Greeks were there mixed in with the Jewish people like the Magi. They were not Jewish they were from a far distant land. These were Gentiles. These Greeks came, and notice what they say. They came up to worship at the feast, verse 21. The same came, therefore, to Philip. Why would they have come to Philip? Philip being from Bethsaida. Philip is a Greek name. He may, may possibly have looked Greek. Yeah, they came up to him, and they said to him, Look, sir, we would see Jesus. 
Show me Jesus. We want to worship Jesus. Show me Jesus. Sir, we would see Jesus. That is our plea when we come here this morning. And friends, when I'm talking about worship, I want to show you fruitful worship. What is the, what is the direction of fruitful worship? This is our first, fourth point this morning. The fruitful worship that is driven by truth. Something caused these Greeks to come and search out Jesus. They were led by faith. They were led by the word that had entered their ears. They, were, they knew that the signs that Jesus had performed, that authenticating that he is the king of kings and lord of lords, they knew that this surely was true. And they come to Philip and they say, Sir, we would see Jesus. In John 4, 15, we read, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When we come to worship, friends, it is important for us to come in the proper way. Do you know this? It is possible to come to worship and have your worship be mute. We're going through the text and we're, we're looking at all these different nuances and the fulfillment of Scripture in Jesus Christ. But it is possible, friends, for you this morning to come to church and have your worship be mute. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever experienced that? That, look, I'm coming here. Remember the question I asked you this morning whenever we first came? When we first entered into this text this morning, I asked you a question. Why are you here? We, we, we find that we come, and, and sometimes it's because of routine. Sometimes it's because we start to just fall into the groove, and that's what we do on Sunday. We want to come here, and just because we like hearing from the Bible every once in a while, and we like to be picked up, but I want you to come and worship. I want your heart to be on the floor before the throne of grace. I want you to see Christ at his word, that he fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies, and that you will come here this morning and say, I'm here because Jesus is king. I'm here because my God reigns. But how can it be that our worship is mute? Have you experienced this? It feels like my praise doesn't reach higher than these lights. I come and it just feels like I'm caught in the same old hamster wheel of life. And I come Sunday after Sunday and I, my worship is mute. There are four reasons. And I'm going to give you four why nots or why your worship is mute. And then I want to give you four reasons, four ways that worship can be heightened in your life. The number one that almost goes without saying is an unrepentant, excuse me, an unredeemed heart. If you come into these church house doors and you have not been born again, I can promise you your worship is mute. It's all empty praise. God says in his word that they honor me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. That's what God's word say, says about war, mute worship. Yeah, their lips sound good. They talk good Christian talk, but their heart is miles from me. It's like their worship is on mute. If you come and you are unredeemed, friend, I beg you this morning, come to Christ. Cast your sins at the feet of Jesus. Be born again. Experience forgiveness and the heightened worship that takes place as a result of that. The number one thing that hinders worship, friends, is an unborn, a, a, a unredeemed heart. The second thing that hinders worship, that puts worship on mute, is an unrepentant heart. Now, what do I mean by that? You're saying, well, wait, wait a minute, if I'm born again, that means I've repented of my sins, I've trusted in Christ, and therefore there's no way that my worship can be on mute because I've repented and trusted in Christ, right? I mean, what is it that's actually taking place in my life, having been born again, that I come in and I want to worship God? How can it be on mute if I'm unrepentant? If you carry, if you are confronted with sin day in and day out, friends, and you do not repent of that sin, it's like your worship is on mute. God will not, God is not here from an unrepentant sinner. We need to 
come here and confess our sins and turn, which is what repent means, turn away from sins. I can mark it down. Mark it down, friends. God has shown you where that sin is. If you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, if you are being led by God, you are being led by his word, he is teaching and guiding you, God shows you where the sin is you need to repent from. And if you fail to repent from that sin and you're coming in here seeking to worship, your worship is unmute. It's as if you're just coming in, you have an unrepentant heart, you know there's sin in your life and you will not repent. I just read this the other day. There was a young man who was abused as a child by his stepbrother. He was abused as a child and he for 30 years he didn't tell the family. He was afraid of breaking up the whole family. He was afraid that the mom and dad would disown him, that his brother would try to hurt him. And he said, and after 30 years, he was abused as a child. After 30 years, he came forward, he told his stepfather and his mother, and they rebuked him. And his comment was this. He was, he was writing this, and he actually said, he said, how I know, he said, I know I'm supposed to forgive. I know that I'm supposed to forgive this individual, but I can't. I know Jesus wants me to forgive, but I can't do it. I, I, I know that I'm supposed to forgive because the Bible teaches me that I am supposed to forgive, but I can't do it. What do I do? That was his writing. That was his comment. You know what you do? You look at the cross, and you say, there is nothing in me that was worth forgiving. What do you do? When you can't forgive, you act like Jesus and you forgive. You forgive because he forgave you. I mean, this is, this is hard stuff to do, but when you come to the word of God and you say, God, I know that you're teaching me that I must forgive and I must bow before your scriptures. I must bow by the spirit of God and forgive you are never more like Jesus Christ in that moment than when you forgive. And some of us have some severely painful things to forgive. But if you want to experience joy, if you want to know the hope that is found in Christ, if you want to know what it means to worship 24-7, you will forgive because you bow to the throne of grace. You bow to Christ. You will forgive because he has forgiven you. There is nothing in this life that cannot be forgiven if you look at the cross and see what he has done for you. How is worship put on mute when you come through these doors and you have an unrepentant heart? If you have an unrepentant heart and you come in here, it's like your worship is on mute. The third thing that puts our worship on mute is unforgiveness. And I've already mentioned that. So I want to give you now the four R's. The four R's of fruitful worship. I simply chose R's because, well, there was four R's that <laughs> went together nicely. The four R's of fruitful worship is number one, redeemed. You come in the blood. You bring your worship. You come through these doors. You walk through this life. You are walking and driven by the Spirit of God. You are under the blood. Worship is a 24-7 lifestyle. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The second is repentant. Confess your sins, friends. Turn away from your sin and repent and come to Christ. Looking unto him as you forgive, as you forgive so shall your Father in heaven forgive you. Reconciled. Here's another one. The third one is the fruitful worship is reconciliation. Reconciliation to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Re reconciliation to your family. Estranged family members. Do you know a phone call is not that hard? A phone call is not that hard to call an estranged family member and say, hey, I've, I've been praying for you. I want you to know that I love you. And whatever it was that made the estrangement take place, whether you need to forgive or they need to forgive, you know what you do? You say, I forgive you. Because we're not here that long. 
If you haven't figured it out yet, we're, our days are very short. In light of eternity, friends, why would you bag, why would you burden yourself down with these, these painful, unforgiving, unrepentant, unreconciled relationships? Why would, you, why would you walk throughout the earth carrying such a burden? Act like Christ, be Christ-like, and rectify that situation. The final one is this, and this is probably the most important, aside from being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Reality. What do I mean by reality? Come to the church house expecting to see and hear God in his word. Come expecting to hear the truth of God. Come expecting, look, I want to hear from God this morning at his word. I was so excited as a young Christian, I, I couldn't wait. I would actually call my pastor up and say, hey, what are you preaching on this week? I would come and say, hey, can you tell me what you're preaching? Can you tell me what the text is we're going to be in this week? Because I want to read it ahead of time. I couldn't wait. I was so excited. I was so hungry. I, I couldn't wait to hear what God had to say that morning. I wanted it early. I would try to get a hold of him and get it out of him, what we're going to be teaching, what we're going to be what we're going to be studying in that Sunday morning. I couldn't wait. Come hungry for the truth of God's word. Come, I will learn something today. I will be more like Christ. My world will be driven by the word of God. I want to leave you with this. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, I love this verse. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, and right beside this verse in my Bible, I have written my wife. Just the words, my wife. In Ephesians chapter 4, 19 and 20, this is, I have that written there because this is what she does. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is our life, Christian. It's what we do. We don't just worship for two hours on a Sunday. Well, our life is committed to the worship of the King of kings and Lord of lords. When we come here to worship, we say, Sir, we would see Jesus. Give me Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, you are King, and you are Lord and glorious. We thank you for this time this morning in your word. I pray, Father, that your truth would sink deep into our hearts and cause us to love you even more. That souls would come to repentance. Guide us this day, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. By way of closing...